through that, the OBS backup, because I'm paranoid. All right. Um, yeah, man. So uh, this has been, I feel, uh, well, I t- so it takes me an hour to get to introduction, but I think everyone knows who you are. So, uh, but please, please, my friend, uh, <laughs> I want to ask you your origin story, actually, to begin with, oh, because okay. yeah, yeah, cause I feel like this is a long time coming. You know, uh, like people, like literally since I was back in the follow the rules days, people, <laughs> follow the rules, uh, break the rules, people were like, uh, oh, you should, you know, talk to Trad Western Art. I'm like, mm, I don't know. We don't, agree. <laughs> I don't think we agree. Like, on maybe we do, maybe we do. We'll see. We'll see. But I'm curious though, because I read your book back in the day. Uh, right. You came out with, um, I have it right here, The Clan of Western Art. Was it before or after Bronze Age Mindset? I won because it was 2018, um, 2018, right? So 2017. I might have been slightly before, but he yeah. was right around the same time. Yeah. And then we were even sort of neck and neck. And then boom, he really took off. <laughs> and I didn't. Yeah. But uh, well, I mean, it's not bad for me for like a first time book. It's not, I know it's not bad, yeah. but it's not, I didn't do as well as him. No, but at first, I, think, I remember him. I think it was like really shortly after I think he came out, but it was around the same time though. Yeah. Yeah. You did pretty good though. I mean, your book did like um like I remember like you were a master at like promoting <laughs> still are. Well, that, you think so, yeah, because I don't know I, I don't I don't feel like I'm good at that marketing stuff or really. I feel I, I feel like marketing is different because like when you're creating like not creating a brand like creating a brand sounds so like cynical and you know, but I think like when it comes which is another question I want to ask you about aesthetic posting, I feel like the book very much was integral. I say was, but is like integral to uh, your whole thing. So we'll, we'll get into that. But um, right. before, before that, like, I, I think the interviews I've, I've listened to you going, like even going back to like before 2018, how did you get involved in this stuff? Like how, what's the origin of, uh, you know, trad Western art or, or right. press now, but uh, I could still, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Should I call you Brennan though? Is that, yeah, is that right? me, yeah, Brandon's fine. Oh, yeah, call me Brandon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. the Trad Western, like, you really were, I feel, uh, one of the first, and I know that term has been vulgarized now, but you really were, like, one of the first, like, aesthetic posters that really, like, made an impact. So, what, like, how did you come about? Like, what were you doing? I think you worked in the illustration world, if I recall. Or you were, yeah, I remember I asking what you were talking about with. So, yeah, so. Yeah, um, I would, yeah, I would have worked for years in, um, and I still do in like graphic design and illustration. Oh, so yeah. origin, like I'll, 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 I'll give the origin story and probably tie it all together. Um, so yeah, it was like, probably like yourself. I was like, I grew up wanting to do art and I went to art school hmm. and I found it to be a bit of a joke. Um, uh, at the time I, I didn't have the, the knowledge and the ideas I have now. And I was sort yeah. of confused by it. And I, I, I really had a, you know, I went through and I, I got my, I got my degree in the end and I, I, t- I chose to get, move away from fine art. And that's when I went into graphic design and stuff like that. And as, as a lot of people do, I think you either want to really try to rough it through as a fine artist in, in the modern sense, you're like really takes a lot of <laughs> hmm. bra- brass necking, like, or sort of, or you have to have a lot of self-promotion ability, let's say, and sort of a, a lot of talk about yourself and ideas that fit into the modern art world, which I didn't. And I knew I knew I didn't yeah. as I was going through the school. So I chose to go something. I thought I need a job. I'm going to do something practical. And I did the graphic design and the illustration. So I've done that really ever since. So for a long time. And um, along with that, let's say for many, many years, after uh, I've been working from home almost not the entire time, but Hmm. for like a long long time i've been like a what do you, what do you call that again whatever someone who works from home and remote uh, work yeah remote whatever yeah for different clients you know big ones small ones whatever so oh, entrepreneur yeah self-employed yeah well whatever yeah my own business and like working from home basically for for like long time like decades even i can say now hmm. <laughs> which sounds like crazy but I'm, I'm old now but um um through so through the course of that and the early internet especially which probably influenced you as well earlier oh, yeah. internet okay, before the pre-censorship internet I would have been constantly imbibing videos and uh, documentaries and sort of learning as, because I'm just working doing visual stuff, right? So oh, yeah. I was free to listen continually to streams of information, and I, and I did. And so it kind of changed and formed my opinions in many interesting ways, <laughs> I feel. Yeah. It was really 
I feel like I really you, educated you myself. Then. You, you radicalized you. Well, <laughs> well, it seems like yeah. Well, everybody seems to. <laughs> they, you yeah. know, it turns them into. Um, you, you either turn into an an extreme sort of, you know, you cast yourself and you start you turn into a furry or something, or <laughs> you go the other way. <laughs> yeah. And so I don't. I've never felt extreme, and I never felt my values change overly from what they were exactly. But at least I was able to put it into words more and probably a bit more extreme anyways than they were. So um, about how long ago? Jeez, I don't know. Over 10 years ago, I started formulating the idea of wanting to write. I just, I made my own opinion about the art stuff, yeah. which, uh, which I had the idea, basically the essential core of the book, the ideas for the book. And I began to sort of write them out and you know dilly-dally with that and think, uh, I never really, I wasn't sure I would seriously ever write a book. So I began to make notes on it and do all that. And then, um, see, this is the, it was around that time. I remember listening to like videos by like Jonathan Bowden and people like this. Oh, and yeah. that kind of inspired me. Like Richard Spencer when he interviewed him, Big Spence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, <laughs> yeah, Richard Spencer, but Bowden was good. Like for, and the way he yeah. talked too. So I was really inspired by that. In a way though, that's my mistake as well. Like if I was to do that book now, I wouldn't do all the lofty language stuff I did. Like I was really very overly descriptive. If, yeah. if it was more, that was my mistake that Bap say didn't. I actually haven't read Bap's book. I know that's I, I I probably should, but I know that his language, his style is like direct. Um, you know, it, he doesn't mess around with the words. He doesn't like try to be overly fluffy with them, and he even does his intentional mispronunciation, uh, misspellings, and and all that. So I wish I had said it a bit more plainly than i did and it's a bit ridiculous mm. when, when i read it back now i think oh like there's no reason for me to be so overly eloquent but that was my mistake i think uh but not that not that i would change it i'm still pretty happy with it overall and all that so um what was my point there i had an original point i've strayed from but anyways uh, th i started making those notes and i had the framework and the idea for the book and like i said i was listening to bowden and and um people like this and i started to see people i just started to notice people on twitter and other places um Facebook actually is where I went uh, at first. They would just self-publish books and um, promote them through their social media. So I thought I can do this too. And mm. obviously yeah. with my book being about art and the subject that really led directly into aesthetic posting, um, oh, yeah. the tra traditional art, you know, for the reason of it's all, it was all to do with promoting my book. And um, that turned into a, sort of accidentally happened to be a good way to grow a page very fast. It turns out it just is, people like that kind of thing and it, it works um oh yeah so that's the, that's the origin of that i don't know does that explain did i cover that well enough to oh yeah pretty good yeah uh but well i think like to lead into it like i it's good for me because i i recently actually signed a book contract so by the end of the year i have to like and it, and it will be about our criticism um right. but yeah so maybe i'll run it by you when i have like all the I have like the, the draft done, but yeah, sure. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's about uh, the, the concept of, uh, I came up with neoliberal catch, but uh, well, more oh, than that, yeah. it's a different essays, but that yeah. leads into my other question about like, what do you have a method to your, like, okay. I had this video once where I, I sort of criticized the vulgarization of it, but the concept of aesthetic posting, you have a very like clear vision, like, you know, having seen your page, uh, over the years, like you, you have a very like succinct, um, like not style. Yeah, I guess you'd say style. Uh, you know, and it, I think it's informed by your work in illustration and so forth. Uh, the women are very sensual and sexy and, uh, you know, it's, it has a lot of architectural themes and like what defines to you aesthetic posting and why is it like, what, what drives the value in it? And also the criticism that like just, um, looking at the aesthetic image itself may not be conducive to action as such, but rather people sort of get lost in the aesthetic. Whereas do you feel that your aesthetic posting, it drives people towards action, right? And then I'll get to like, you know, eventually, you know, criticism in the book and so forth, but yeah. So aesthetic posting, go ahead, my friend. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, I would say it drives people towards action. It's sort of like a, it's not an easy thing to describe or to uh, how people react to it is sort of their own business, I guess. And that's going to be yeah. a, a bit subjective, but yeah, there is an overall ethos to it, which is also hard to describe because a lot of it is just like, okay, <laughs> mm -hmm. I could easily just say it's, you know, subjectively my taste in aesthetics or whatever, but uh, there is the, over, like say, I'd have to talk about say the premise in the book, which was my, 
So let's say in my origin story too, there was a stage not long after school. It was when I bought a book on Victorian painting, I recall, a large mm -hmm. book. And it was the first book for somehow at that time that I, a historic art book that had no reference to any uh, modernist painting um, abstract art. And I thought, and it just dawned on me, there was a time when that stuff just simply didn't exist. Yeah. And I'd been sort of racking my brains as to why art, the art world of art seems so terrible and nonsensical, generally speaking nowadays, and how and why and where did this begin? So I thought, well, I'm gonna trace this back to where I feel it must begin. What is the what is the ethos of art before it? What happened to twist it into this new thing? Because it just obviously has a whole other direction. And I more or less came to the conclusion it was, I don't know, it deliberately, generally speaking deliberately, but like even then it, it's almost more like a force majeure in a way, but it, it was more or yeah. less deliberately uh, morphed, I would say, at one stage to be just more or less anti-tradition, to against be... Uh, uh, and it's at its core, its motiva motivating values were just to be anti against the tradition that came before it in a kind of progressive sort of neoliberal kind of way that we see applied to other things nowadays. But it was applied to art originally. So that was my premise. And mm. that, this, is where, this is where this uh, viewed art came about and why it's been progressively more ruinous ever since. And it began with really those uh, pop, pop abstract painters that were made famous in the early 20th century. Um, so, again, I've wandered away from my original point. What was I going about to say about that? Oh, about aesthetic pop, uh, aesthetic pop. Oh, right, aesthetic pop, right. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. So, with that in mind, see, then, so then for a long time, I did just sort of do the really traditional buildings and paintings, and then two things happened. Is first, I got, I did always as well have, as you say, the chicks and the heavy metal magazine and the nice cars and other aesthetics oh, yeah. that heavy metal, you know, things I like personally that I couldn't, I found difficult to explain and tried to stop myself from posting, <laughs> thinking, it would, thinking it would obviously confuse people and not fit in or whatever, this and that. But then I sort of realized that it does fit in. It does fit in as those were the sort of tail end of expressions of art, um, even though they seem sort of exploitative or poppy in their way, even silly at times. But that was like the dying embers of like, a kind of uh, orderly aesthetic, even uh, yes. that was something with a uniting theme and so forth. Even though it's hard for some people's stomachs, not everyone's a fan of these things, specifically these genre things, you know, science fiction and stuff like that. But um, to me, it made sense. And it was, you know, muscle cars and things. I was able to f explain it satisfactorily to myself. Not that I necessarily bothered to anybody else. But then I also realized I didn't want to just write the one book. I wanted to write other kinds of books so there's no point limiting limiting myself just painting or just posting the the uh, in Milan Domo a hundred times a day like these other ones do. But no, that's all yeah. they do. <laughs> yeah, these so. other ones they do have like they, it's sort of uh they limit themselves to something and they just like pick anything and yeah, there's no grace to it. But uh, yeah. with <laughs> uh, not to name names, but it, it is it is funny though because I I think it it is integral to like the a lot of the the one thesis in your book being that really illustration or the classic the golden age of illustration that they were the um, forebears of the western art tradition rather than a lot of uh you know and like i was listening to your podcast with astro astro is a good friend of mine and he pushed oh, yeah. me he yeah and uh i'm like well you know astro it's gonna be different because a lot of these painters you mentioned i happen to be bands of right like so but we'll get into that before i want to get into that when it comes to uh the woman thing even like recently i was i think it was on telegram you were or on twitter you were saying like some like i don't know rad femme was uh you know misconstrued your sentence where you said that you know <laughs> like women and certain people deserve a level of cruelty but i remember someone replied in your uh, telegram which is very succinct that i think like historically there's a level of indifference that men had towards the concerns of uh, women and so forth. And I think like a playful indifference is probably better worded than cruelty, but what, yeah, but the women thing, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you know, yeah, you intentionally ahead, say, you, yeah. well, I just want, no, just on that point, you intentionally say the most sensational words sometimes unopposed just to, oh, yeah. you know, so anyways, right. Yeah. You just <laughs> yeah. But no, but I think it comes up recently because recently the whole, um, there was this TikTok video and it, it's this like, you know, stay at home wife and she's wearing like 50s flower dresses. And it's sort of like the whole 
Um, which I, I do agree with, at least in part, that I think the like trad aesthetic is becoming a form of pornography. Like, what do you like? But of course, people have accused you of this over the years. So, but what do you think of like the whole tradition in a living sense versus a sort of uh, like what would you call like a kitsch image of it on TikTok? Some woman, you know, baking a spinny wheel pie or whatever. Like, it's obviously like a pick me type of thing, but. Behind that, I feel that the response to it is equally terrible where leftoids are like, no, no one was ever happy in the 50s. They're all, you know, <laughs> oppressed and so forth. So where do you land in that? Because you do, like, you're not like a typical, I would think, like, trad account in that you are willing to post the voluptuousness of the female nude and you get a lot of heat for that as well. So you're in a very unique position to feel. Maybe you could comment on the whole, like, trad LARP discourse, I guess you could say, yeah. Trad LARP discourse, yes, gladly. Well, so that concept of trad really has come up, or at least become um, popular and prevalent since I started the account and the name. So, I've, yeah. and at the time since I've, I've obviously regretted using the word trad in in the whole business. But I mean, now I don't. Not only because there's so many that would just covet the uh, <laughs> covet that yeah. uh, that at on uh, Twitter, but. It's, you know, it's fine because I did my concept of trad from the beginning was as a sort of Evolian uh, traditionalist. It wasn't specifically yes. uh, Norman Rockwell church paintings kind of uh, tradition. Right. So yeah. I'm not even like yeah. I'm a bit more of a pagan than I am a Christian as it happens. So I'm not there's no there's no moral value uh, problem uh, conundrum with me personally. Like I don't. People, people say a lot of people, people see trad and they think, oh, it's got to be Christian. It's got to be about, you know, uh, covering up the women, modesty and this kind of thing. But that was never in my concept of trad to begin with. I think of ancient Rome and Greece, Egypt, you know, I don't yeah. uh, I was never of that kind to begin with. So so that's where I would fall in that. Um, I just was never that type that type of, you know, they sort of own the word trad now because the you know, it became po so popular, the cottage core and all the, yeah, the housewife stuff and all that. And it's really fairly specifically Christian. They have ideas of, it's, it seems very Christian. And I have nothing against Christianity. I am still consider myself at least partially a Christian, but mm. I was never uh, into that. And it does not fit in with my person. So what can I say? Once again, I'm just like, this, you know, you have your definition, I have mine. Theirs is maybe more common. So you always have to end up arguing with them about it or whatever. But yeah, that's but what I would say about it. Yeah, and I feel like the, the second part with that would be, do you feel that there is like a vulgarization of it? I mean, it seems that oh. there there is yeah. like an Oedipalization of, although like, I, I wouldn't call it, I mean, as a youngian, I wouldn't like say Oedipalization that flippantly, but there is something there. There is like at least a psychosexual drive to it. Not to like cast all aspersions on it, but it's it's very clear what these TikTok women are doing, obviously. I mean, you know, yeah. it's very, yeah. yeah. Well, it's healthy in a way. I mean, yeah, it is, at, least, at least they're not, you know, Shaving off their head and uh, showing their armpits and you know cutting off their breasts, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. at least a better alternative than that. But yes, it does. It has been. It does get cheesy and becomes a silly thing. And I don't. I've never paid much attention to it, to be honest. Um, so. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But that that is another question would be um. Like when it comes to your book, like I, I mentioned that because not only there's that you came, the books came out at the same time, but also this, this sort of similar themes. There was one part I remember specifically recently when you were um, talking with Astral about how uh, the, the development of Western art, the Greeks perfected something that was beyond realism per se. And I feel like my criticism of the sort of approach that most people have, like in these traditional spaces would be the sort of predication on the value of, realism as qua realism as even photorealism which as we you know both we can agree is like sort of a, oh, still trash. like yeah but yeah it's you like you a think about it and don't waste your time <laughs> it's, yeah it's, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah but no but the reason i think it's similar in that you both posit that the greeks perfected a form of high realism and it's something that okay. i wanted to ask you specifically like you you said in the interview with astral that even the renaissance like the later renaissance wasn't exactly the ideal that you were looking for and a lot of people would you know hear that and be like oh my god that's like oh how can you say that you know because they figured like you know after van eyck the high renaissance the you know venetian renaissance so forth but what do you mean by that in that the greeks perfected a form of realism 
that is akin to the Western spirit that you're getting at? Like what, what's the very, like what's the essence of what the Greeks and Romans perfected that was sort of lost over the centuries, even lost in the Renaissance, even with the, the reawakening of Hellenism in Italy and Germany and so forth. Yeah. Well, in terms of visual art, it's really the golden ratio stuff and the idea of the, uh, which I went into quite a bit with him, I think, did I? I'm pretty yeah, sure I did. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, the concept that everything must relate, every little part of a... You know, with the Greeks, you always think of sculpture first, and it's probably the most <laughs> ideal thing to think of them of, because it is right. the perfect, um, perfected example of this, where every little part of it is in relation to the whole, mathematically, like not just geometrically, but following this formula. And that formula is, con is a kind of a formula for eternity, for eternal variation and change the spiral of the of the uh, golden ratio so this this concept was in their art at its core um i would never use first first of all i never even used the term realism or i wouldn't say perfected real i wouldn't use realism in terms of art right right um i don't like that term it, it, nowadays it suggests either the photorealist stuff or that there's an alternative that it, it gives credence in my mind to the abstract stuff which you know unless you're abstracting for the reason of heavy style uh, with a kind of full grasp of the technical uh, uh, you know, powers you need to have at hand, then I tend to dismiss a lot of abstract stuff as merely the sort of waffle of uh, this personal expression stuff that came along with the, um, with the pop artists of the 20th century. So I would avoid the, the term realism, but in terms of what the Greeks perfected and how it did resurface and re- um, what's the word? Re, not incentivize. Uh, oh, like inspire, re-inspire the rena the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Um, and really, all the art since, even like if you go into a historic gallery, you know anything right up through into the 20th century, you'll see a lot of reference to not just Hellenic sculpture, but in the paintings, Hellenic myth, and the kind of perfected Arcadian concept of like a, an earthly paradise is everything's very natural. Yeah. Following in, following in these ratios and concepts of, of eternity, it's all there in the art. It's like, it's the hidden layer to the art that you don't see unless you know how to do a painting to that level or a sculpture to that level. So just by the influence it had and resurging and coming back and even still has, you know, even though it's really, it's still with us, but I don't know. I'm sure it can make a comeback again. Right. Um, but the impact and the importance of it and the why is it, why did they perfect? I don't like, I'm not sure it's, I wouldn't even say it perfected. They, I, I did probably say they perfected in the book and perhaps they did perfect. Maybe it can be even further perf per, uh, perfected. I'm not sure, but it is an attitude and a concept of art, which is, beauty is paramount as well. Mm -hmm. And beauty is linked to the idea of goodness and eternity as well. So it has a spiritual and a scientific uh, relevance all tied up together with it as well. And I'm just not sure, like, can you think of an epoch or a culture that you would say surpassed their level of skill and what they did with the Parthenon and the, and the oh. marbles and the art we know about? I mean, maybe you can. There's that's, some... hard. Yeah, that's hard to think about because if you're talking specifically about the way that they viewed the work of art, as opposed to the way that, like, for example, the architecture that came out of the 20th century, um, like some of it's good. Like, I mean, I'm a fan of some of it, but mm. yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint because I feel like, uh, well, well you go ahead. I mean, I have a question about, uh, okay. like the value of it, but yeah, you, sir, you, you were leading up to a point, but uh, maybe, maybe, cause it really depends because of the situation, the situatedness of each civilization. For example, uh, you know, I did a lot of grad work in, um, the Chinese literati painting and in Taoism and Zen, and they have their own approach yeah. to what, yeah, I, yeah, well, this is... And do you, would you consider yourself a, a bit of a Taoist or a Zen guy, or? At one point, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to interlope on, like, another culture. I feel like uh, Owen Cyclops has the best approach to it. The, I studied it for many years, but I wouldn't, I mean, I, I certainly think that Taoism is much easier to integrate into certain forms of Christianity. But I bring it up because I feel like when it comes to the sort of the literati painting being something beyond the art object, something that's very integral to their practice and their way of life and the way that they view reality as a sort of um, 
a room making, right? As a sort of boue, yeah. right? Uh, I yeah. feel like that's a different definition of per perfection than the sort of full presence of being that you have in the West that started from the Greeks, maybe even before the Greeks. I mean, of course, if you're someone like Georgiani, you think the Iranians did everything, but you know what I mean? Like, let's say. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But you do, you Greeks, do have to look at the sheer, sheer level of creativity the Greeks did represent beyond just the art oh, yeah. in terms of philosophy and everything else that they heavily influenced the entire world and still to this exactly. day. Exactly, yeah, and that's the, my point. The, yeah. the kind of creativity that was going on at that time, it was incredibly flourishing and like just spontaneous, total. <laughs> I'm not sure there's ever been a more creative time, like intelligent uh, creativity too, not like just like a really well thought out, considered from every angle, all the all the musing and philosophy about what is good and what is just and how can we have harmony and like yeah, endless debates yeah. about this. Um. So it, it just plays through the, in the art and the a level of skill and importance they put on these things. So it's hard yeah. from our modern viewpoint, uh, seeing through the ass end of the 20th century and where we are at now to even see, fully understand what they were at. And like you, you mentioned at one point, what, what, what I would return to, like, I don't, I don't, this is the thing that I think confuses people. Yeah. Uh, maybe sometimes I don't have a concept of what can be returned to or where to go. I just know that I feel we were lied to and art was sort of misdirected and became really very absurd over the last um, over 100 years. And not that we can just turn that off and go back and do anything. You just it's not how it works. Like there's right. right. The, the turn of the screw is the worm is turned and evolution is pointed in a different direction. But we still have knowledge of, say, the Greeks in the earlier periods and like. Any art movement that ever happens, you say even the Greeks were heavily influenced by the Egyptians and oh, yeah. and others, right? So you take things from the past, the best things that you see that you want to revive or see continue, and you sort of mix them with something else, and you ho hopefully come up with a new kind of art. Um, yeah, so it would have to be more, more well considered than I still believe the art of today is generally predicated upon just being anti-tradition against the Greeks and everything that came before just to sort of be like, be still doing the same kind of shock value stuff. Like, look, look at this. I can, I can, you know, stand in the theater with my pants down. Look at me <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> just like, you know, stupid shit. Yeah. I mean, I, I've certainly spent many times, uh, me a lot of time, um, at least intellectually entertaining. Uh, I've, I've much more of a, a sort of, uh, I've much more of an affection for a lot of the 20th century painters than I do certainly like conceptualism and performance art. I mean, apart from certain things like, um, I don't know, maybe Joseph Byers, but he was like a commie and like, I don't know, painting your face. And like, like he, that was pretty, uh, that was pretty great person Giga Chad, the way he uh, was, he, he like uh, had that performance where he was locked in a cage with a wolf. But they starved for a few days. That was pretty great. Place, but <laughs> oh, I like um, you know who I like is uh, Andy Warhol, and there's a few oh, like yeah. that. Yeah. Just because they feel like I feel like they're just like you know, thank you. You know, he got other people to paint his paintings. He was obviously just <laughs> just like you know. Well, he was critiquing the system of like yeah, mass yeah, production. critiquing the system. Yeah, 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 exactly. He was it was it was all kind of tongue in cheek and kind of you know he wouldn't take it seriously. Anyways, he would just be laughing at. Yeah, and his track Catholicism, people. like I feel, prepped him to. Uh, like like realize the idolization of celebrity in the modern world but but i think like to get back to what you were saying yeah. we can talk about warhol a little bit more but you were saying about representation i think representation would probably be a better word than quote unquote realism because yeah. the dichotomy yeah. like like even studying the 20th century i, I know you you know <laughs> you don't like them but i feel like a lot of them they at least claimed that they were uh beholden to an older tradition that academicism abandoned, at least in part. I, I'm thinking of painters specifically like Mark like Toby. Who? Well, like, yeah, Mark Toby, certainly that came before Pollock and like all of those like Northwest, um, Northwest visionary school painters, like Morris Graves. They certainly, even here in Canada, the group of seven, for instance, like they certainly thought that they were um, like the category of like abstraction and what like Greenberg and other art critics, I think like it was an art, it was an artifice. Because when you pit realism against abstraction, you look back and you see, like, even the, you know, way before, like, without Greco, you could say, oh, that's abstraction. Like, there, there's something missing in that dichotomy that I think you're getting at. But, of course, what I didn't like about the book is if I felt like you were really going into, like, you were laser focusing on the debasement of that tradition 
because a lot of people think, like, for example, I have much more of an affinity towards, you know, uh, Toby and Jackson Pollock than I do with Rothko. Because with Rothko, very clearly, I mean, without, you know, for YouTube purposes, let's not get too much. It, well, maybe yeah. I'll pay, I'll pay wall, I can pay wall. But, <laughs> but, it, but, you know, like there is a, a conscious subversion of my position in the world as a particular identity, as a particular like newly landed immigrant. Um, like this is what yeah. the Western tradition is and this is what my tradition is. And that yeah. therefore, like, I, I get it though. Like I, I get what Rothko is doing in terms of him trying to depict like sensuous feeling as a, a total entity. But that being said, at the end of the day, he still had this very like thumb in the eye approach to like what came before him. And I feel like that was motivated in part, like he even said the, so I think he said like this quote where like, um, and this is what made me much less sympathetic to him than say like Frankenthaler or Pollock, where he said like, I'll never travel outside of New York or California because the Amer middle America is like filled with like fascists that want to, you know, redact me or whatever. So he said something like that, which I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe in the fifties, I don't know, maybe you, you could make a case for that, but like, was, yeah. someone, someone but, similar is probably saying something right now. But well, yeah. that's <laughs> what I mean. People have, yeah. In their world, yeah. definitely people are sitting like, uh, I'm sure Kendall Wiley or, uh, Kara Walker has said something similar, but you know, uh, but my point being is that I feel like those categories of abstraction and, and realism, they don't really denote because people could look at a Greek, like an icon from Andrew Rublev and they'd say, Oh, that's abstraction. So that doesn't really make sense to me because I feel like painters like Mark Toby, they were trying to deal with that same naturalism, but like, especially, you know, Mark Toby going to Japan and like being a Baha'i person and trying to integrate a lot of like literati painting and white writing and, and like calligraphy. Uh, I mean, you could say that it came out as like a jumbled perennial mess, but I feel like that spirit was there as opposed to someone like that came later on, like Rothko. I, I don't know. Like, but, I mean, of course you would say that it's abstract. It's terrible, but uh, go ahead. That's not, not, not exactly the rule. I would say that. No, it's... Okay, yeah. This is what I want to get. So go ahead, please. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, okay. So I would take, I would see my in the, the way I laid out in the book. See, if you are concerned about the, the state of the art world and the way it is, and want to look at why it is the way it is, because right. it's so nonsensical, and people who are not involved, and in, even even I who went to art school didn't really make any realizations about it until years afterwards, because it's very confusing. But yeah. you can trace it really, as I said, to these to those origins, and those origins were in my view, as I say in the book, excused by the language of Greenberg, which I, I you know, I have to say, I feel like you were using there, let's say when you're talking about Rothko, you, you get what he's doing with creating essential uh, experience, essential uh, experience, etc. I mean, that really is a lot of like lofty talk for a guy that's painting three stripes, ultimately. Now, I know you can say, technically speaking, or 100% rationally speaking, exactly what he's done can have a certain pleasing effect to the eye. He's chosen this color and that color. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, like simple little rationalizations that everyone knows that a child, I believe, are real. And if a painter is presenting a work to you, it's fine if it's abstract. Like, let's say a later Turner or even later Rembrandt's or like, you know, a lot of guys did uh, abstract stuff. As I, Again, I, I feel like that's I, I prefer to call that heavy, a heavy style. But if someone's present, presented you a painting that may have been done by a child or a chicken, <laughs> then you really have to. There is a little. You know, if you if there's really no discernible way to tell 100 percent, like say in a Pollock, that right. it isn't just like, he himself just threw his splatters around. He grabbed his paintbrush, is he grabbed his brushes, dipped them, dipped them in the paint, and just flung them around. Right. So it's, you can say, objectively speaking, there's not a method of genius there. I mean, there is, and say wow. he's chosen, he's chosen to fling paint though, to the left. He's chosen to fling <laughs> pink paint to the right. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. No, no, but no, yeah, but, he has okay. a, but he does have okay, like but a look, sort of... No, my ultimate point is... Uh, okay, as go I said ahead. Book, sorry, sorry. Uh, this ahead. is the ultimate point right here. As I said in the book, you know, <laughs> oh, I, do, I, I do believe that um, let's say Rembrandt could paint a Pollock for you in an hour or so. I do not believe, given his entire life, Pollock could paint for you a Rembrandt. No, it's true. I mean, uh, his earlier work was much different, but I... I no, it was but terrible. A, it was terrible. No, there, <laughs> I thought... There, but I think it was because you... No. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I don't. Sorry, sorry. No, no. I was going to say. I think. I think because he was trying to represent like a lot of the, uh, you know, Iroquois indigenous tribes that are around him. Of course, nowadays, like that's why Pollock's been canceled, obviously, because of he's been 
sit, you know, they see as like cultural appropriation, especially oh, in Canada. Yeah, yeah, like here, especially here in Canada. Um, if like as an artist myself, I I make a point to never touch any indigenous themes because you'll immediately it's way worse here in Canada, of course, in America. Uh, but still, like Pollock was canceled. Right. The, uh, well, I'm from Canada too. I, where uh, do you say where you're from? Or is it a secret title? No, no, no. I'm I'm very open where from. I'm I live right near Niagara Falls. So uh, oh, over there, right? Yeah, very good. yeah, yeah. So I, I was from uh, BC. I grew oh, up really? BC. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. That's yeah. Good. yeah. But you you live in England now or um... uh, Ireland? Yeah. Oh, Ireland. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I always um, had an Irish. Yeah, so, but yeah. So yeah, there wasn't many. Um, there wasn't many much native stuff around where we grew up. Well, I was right in the Rockies in a small town, but there was a lot of old mm. like uh, trapper cabins and cool old log cabins. As far like architecturally, otherwise it was just like a oh, box yeah. plaza from the eighties. <laughs> you know, there yeah. was no whatever. Right. I'm, I'm weird. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, no, what I mean is that, like, yeah, Pollock he couldn't paint a rim brown. Okay, I will give you that. Uh, but I feel like Pollock. Like, like he wasn't exactly doing it at random. He did have a sort of a method and a dance, and he was trying to represent motion. And, and he's like, okay, I could just, yeah, I could, yeah. I could feel you rolling your eyes at me, Brad. No, 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 that's okay. No, that's not bad. No, no, I can accept that. I can accept that. I just don't think it's that amazing. Like, okay, fine, you've there done that. There is a color like, field there. There is like sort of yeah. a rhythm in a color field, and like especially yeah. his like later works before he. Uh, well, before he like did a joyride uh, a, a bit too far, uh, you know, drunk in upstate New York. But they, I saw the, was, I saw the movie. I saw the movie with Ed Harris. That's uh, so I know I only know his story from that. And the woman he was with, who like refused to have kids, and he was getting all angry with her. She was a yeah. That too, was right? actually more or less true. The 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 movie. Uh, but he he had this thing. I I guess another like Giga Chat Griperous move would be he had this thing where he would joyride uh, plastered. And that was sort of like his acceleration <laughs> to like accelerate into an oak tree. Uh, but yeah. but no, I feel like that's what I mean. The like where, where he, I, 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 like where he played to lights and darks and stuff. You know, he he had a certain yeah, uh, yeah. you know stuff like that. But that's only one one hundredth of a skill of a of an old timey painter. <laughs> so well, I just yeah, feel like it's a exactly bit of a scam and the language I used to promote him and everything. I just but that's that's even though even though you may give him excuses and say he's not so bad, it's that. It's right there is where the rift began that leads to what we have today. You know, in no, my view. I know, but a lot of things led to what we have today. And I feel like like people that say Christianity is like what led to like the secularization of Christian morals is so my you know that? problem. What? That Christianity led to what? Like, you know, modern, like whatever you want to call it, progressive global liberalism. Which oh, if there is an, well, an argument you can after make. After like two thousand years. I mean that, <laughs> the, yeah, nothing, that's pretty good. Right. Yeah, exactly. Nothing lasts forever. Like no, it's well, true, I true. mean, uh, some things do last forever, but everything changes. A hair, I believe very strongly Heraclitus was right that everything changes. Oh, yeah. Everything. But I, I do get what you mean, though. I mean, I feel like as soon as you... My argument would be that a lot of these modern painters were responding in some ways dialectically to what came before them in sort of the age of anxiety and technology and what it brought about. And that sort of painting... Like you you were talking about this last year, like painting had to go somewhere... And I eventually want to get to the question of like, you know, painting being dead. I feel like that question is so ridiculous even because like a lot of people like periodically have come through the years and just like declared the death of painting. Now it's like AI will create the death of painting. It's, oh, you know, God. Yeah, it's like, it's like Hegel couldn't do it. Arthur Danto couldn't do it. It's like, what other critics going to come along and say that, you know, paintings, I don't know, maybe some tech bro says you know we'll say that nfts are going to body painting well i mean nfts no. lasted a year painting lasted i don't know <laughs> a thousand years. well more actually yeah, yeah. so um yeah. well no not that nfts are dead but you know I, my point well, being is i like what would you say to the argument that like painting had to go somewhere and dialectically there was a certain move like moves that happened in the 19th and 20th centuries that dictated the course of the art world rightfully yeah. or wrongfully yeah go ahead sorry i'll cut you off Brandon. well okay so it's a tricky old thing it's a tricky old thing so yeah you can say it, once again if you look at painting from my point of view it's ultimately craft it's the same as making a chair or a table it's just when it's done to the genius level 
which was perfected by the craft guilds. You get the likes of, again, Rembrandt and so forth, right? It's just a chair maker right. who is so incredibly skilled that he just can do it, something that's godlike. So that begins the idea that there's something to painting at the higher levels, at least, that is inexplicably, unexplainably intellectual and spiritual, which is true in a dare I say, abstract way, but yeah. it became it became the whole concept of painting that you are actually intellectualizing and giving a secret message through this work. And that was the whole criteria for the painting. When really, ultimately, you know, this sounds crude, but it really is, give me something nice to put on my wall or whatever, right? And mm -hmm. so that need, mm -hmm. that need still exists. Oh, yeah. The need for beauty still exists. Portraits less so maybe with, see, photography kind of messed things, uh, changed things a lot in that regard as well. You have to consider yes. that even though it didn't destroy painting. There was a lot of excellent, excellent painting post-photography. Oh, yeah. But a photograph will never uh, match a painting. In fact, I get annoyed when these photographers call themselves art. I'm an artist. I'm a photographer. I'm like, well, you know, maybe you are kind of, but <laughs> it's compared to a painter. Some, some of them that are aware of the medium, perhaps. But I, I got in this argument, actually, my friend Gibson Given, because she... Uh, you know, she's a, a video artist, but she's like, no, photography is not art. And I go, well, what about Francesca Woodman? And, you know, what about um, Giacomelli and other people? Like, no, 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 Gio, you don't get it. It's not like, <laughs> yeah, which I mean, yeah. I'm a critic of digital art, but I feel like if photography is aware of itself and its manipulation. Then... Well, there's an art to it. There's an yeah. art to it. And yeah. it is a world to its own. Say, so, like, you know. Yeah, but it'll never compare to painting, obviously. That's, I mean, yeah. Well, painting, you are creating a world from nothing out of your mind. Like, every painting is like that. You're creating the light of the right. world and every bit of it and doing, like, there's so much more to it, really. Right, right. These are the things I try to, cons I always consider in my mind, the labor of the artist himself, the labor and the intelligence to do something like that. It's so much more is required than a photographer. Same as it's so much more to do properly um, in a traditional painting versus a Pollock and so forth. There's just so much more involved that you have to respect. This is where we get the idea that they're a genius. Like, I could never do that. Um, so so painting, it, it will never go away. There will always be a need, a desire to draw. Right. A desire and a need to represent at least imagine, imaginative things. Like even say now with my Aegean books, I always need art. Either yeah. I do it myself or I, I get people to do it, to do illustrations, to create a little, because it's a science fiction magazine, I need little drawings, little pulpy style, you know, uh, drawings and things. So there's always, it seems like there's always going to be a need out there. AI is another quotient that throws a, a wrench in the works. But again, it's like a, uh, I agree that it's kind of like, I mean, who knows what it'll, maybe it'll go somewhere we can never expect, but it seems right. like another, attack, it seems like another attack from left field that doesn't, it's like something else. And you can do that if you like. But it's only going to be, it's only ever really going to be digital in a lot of ways. But then <laughs> I could mm -hmm. go down, I could, I could get lost in my own thoughts. I'm sorry. But like when you, when like real painting, like a real oil painting, and you look at it up close and you can see the brush strokes of the painter, and, and that's the masterly effect of the brush stroke and the color he's chosen to use and just like, yeah, you know, and the, and the hue and all. the temperature. And yeah, yeah. But it's a real human, tangible material experience that is, does not translate to the digital world. And digital is fine. You can do digital art and it's all, you know, fine and good, but it's just like its own other separate thing yeah. to me as well. Same with, so same with this um, AI stuff is obviously very much in that realm. Usually it looks quite inhuman and not great to me <laughs> overall. Yeah. Although I did, I saw one today, Dave Martell was showing me one he had and I was like, he fooled me. I was like, who did that? They're, that's pretty good. And it was actually AI. So that's the first one I saw that I could, couldn't really tell right off the bat. Um, yeah, most you could tell actually. I feel, um, like, yeah, but, like people yeah. get into the technical weeds, like, it's not exactly artificial intelligence, it's really just algorithmic knowledge that are like that's like cobbling together styles and so forth. And you could play around with it. I mean, I've, I've played around with it a little bit, the phone app one, but it, 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 you could tell, and even if they do perfect, I feel like the, the vibe of the painting and the texture of it, there still is, I, how shall I put it? There still is like an essence in a world that's there within real painting that will never die. That never, that by definition is eternal. And it yeah, I figure, and I figure, yeah. And some people will always want to do it that way, the traditional way, the yeah. proper real painting. So it'll exist, but it's getting ever more, um, you know, pushed aside a little bit. It gets more and more of a neat, very niche thing compared to how, like in the days, say of Rembrandt and, and those guys, it was like in yeah. high demand. So it's the fact of incentives and demand factor into this. So when you say that you don't don't think painting can die, 
yeah, I can't probably die. They can't completely extinguish it. But in the culture right now and the direction it's going for however yeah. long it lasts in the direction, I don't know. It's um, definitely very like real painting, very uh, like underground activity, really, I guess. Right. Or I don't know, maybe I, I suppose there's people out there selling, uh, there, doing well yeah. and selling, selling their art. But then they're probably very much in this fine art world that I don't agree with doing what I would consider fairly well nonsense. Um, most of the ones doing, well, not entirely. Like, so what are the rest called? They still call them illustrators, just like those golden age illustrators who didn't get to be, to be called fine artists. Mm. So there's a lot of very talented illustrators. Most of them would be digital now, now too, though, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, the, like my problem is that the, the sort of aesthetic template of most people, like their, their palette is very much informed by like digital art. That is like we were saying before, like realism doesn't exactly capture it because it's very realist, but it's like, you know, furry porn. Like it's, it's like that type of like very, or like very kitschy Tumblr, like post Tumblr, like type of Instagram friendly illustration that you get like every art hoe, like has the digital <laughs> Wacom tablet, you know, it's like, yeah. 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 And they can do okay. You know, some of them can be, some of them can be really good in their way, yeah. you know, for what yeah. it is. Right. But, um, but yeah, that's how it is. So it, just everything's different. The world is not set up the way it is now to, sorry, to facilitate and blossom into a new kind of a culture that's going to create the next a revival in either traditional painting or Greek sculpture or these things like whatever influence they can have upon the direction we're on, which I'm sure they will. It'll yeah. resurface in some way we can never guess. Evolution works in these ways, as far as I can see. You can never tell what direction it's going to take. So in me and my book there, I'm complaining about what happened. I say, I think it's uh, just trying to explain to myself and to the world what I think happened to art, why it went down the tubes, and it wasn't necessary. And it was based on lies. And, you know, maybe you could just rescue it. Maybe you could just go back and say, okay, we're going to go free 20th century and... <sighs> But no, I don't. You couldn't. Do, you couldn't do that in any way. And the, in the structure of our societies these days is too—they're too worried about other things, and there's no unity in them to get rally behind such a, such a, such a notion. Nobody cares even anymore because art's been so far out of most people, the average person's mind. Yeah. For so long it's, that they, the culture they wouldn't industry. Yeah. 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 So. But do you, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, I don't know. I, I've got. I don't know. I'm just rambling. Sorry. No, was, no it's okay. Uh, no, I was gonna say like two things. One would be. Um, I, I f have you ever read the uh, the Heidegger essay Origins of the Work of Art? Have you come across it? Maybe I can't remember. I can't remember the details of it though. So if you know it, remind me. Yeah, yeah. I feel like what you're getting at is something that Heidegger would definitely be like in favor of, which is the how shall I describe it? The work of art unites the world with the earth, the sort of material of a civilization and its culture and its people at a very deep primordial level. And art always interrogates what that culture and civilization is. And he, he very much points to like the Parthenon in Greece, how, you, you know, outside of that civilization, that object becomes a museum piece. It still has meaning but it doesn't necessarily have the same meaning to us. But then, you know, other people like that, I know, like uh, my one, my, my one acquaintance, Paul talk, he would say that, uh, Oh no, actually that's like relativism that every civilization has their own like gestalt and that, you know, you can't really, uh, there's no like universalism to it. I go, I don't think that's necessarily what Heidegger was getting at, but definitely I feel like you're, yeah. what you're proposing is that each epoch has its own world that is created by the, um, the aesthetic experience of that civilization and that when, you know, like you mentioned in your book with Spangler, you know, when there is that winter period, then the work of art experiences several crises and we're sort of in this position where creating a new definitely requires something that goes against the grain of its own particular, the, the world of a particular culture or epoch. So yeah. I don't know if is that exactly what you're saying or not? I don't know. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, I mm. think so. More or less. We are also at the same time, the inheritors of that tradition started with the Greeks, arguably with the Greeks. Like Spangler himself said, it was, more, I believe with Western, like most modern people would say it begins with Christianity. Again, the trads would say, oh, it begins with Christianity, but no, it begins with the Greeks, I would say. And 
Mm-hmm. Again, I agree with Spengler, arguably with the Egyptians, really, actually. Um, that is really the heart of where it begins. And we're still part of that thing they started, and, and, albeit in a state of you know relative chaos. Although there's been chaos before. Pretty, oh, yeah. pretty substantive chaos, I think, and dissipation is going on now. And so it, like people get flustered and bemused when you don't have when you're not offering some kind of solution or some way out of the, the way it is. But right, right. I, I don't know. The idea of like coming up with an art movement that's going to take the world by storm and redirect it in a, in a certain way, you know, maybe that can be done. That certainly was the goal of art movements of the past. That these guys yeah. would get together and, you know, they'd say, we're going to, we're futurists. We're going to do this. So not to say it's impossible. Maybe I just can't, maybe I'm limited and I can't see how to do it or I'm too busy <laughs> or whatever. But, um, well, like postmodernity is like basically destroyed like movement of different art pieces. It seems that we live in like terminal, like, you know, this is what Jameson said. Like we live in terminal eclecticism and there's this collapse of high and low culture. And now you have a uh, millennial YouTube video essayists talk about, you know, pop culture as if it's worthy of like our criticism. Like it's, you know, it's like the way that Baudelaire talked about Poussin. Like it's the way that, mm-hmm. I don't know, Jacob Geller talks about whatever, like LGBT friendly uh, movie last of us whatever that comes out so it's like i don't oh i don't know who you're talking about at the end there but yeah or the movie <laughs> but, but you yeah. know the the millennial video essay is just sort of like right. pop culture becomes well what do you think of that like pop culture becomes this object of like intellectual pursuit and study it's really just a, it's a disney movie like what are you talking yeah, about yeah yeah you it's know? very silly yeah but especially with pop culture the way it is where it's like a derivative of a derivative and they really controlled it so tightly i think you know i think around the time i said this in the book as well around the time of the the lesson they learned from the post 60s was they had the revolution of music of in the 60s which was excellent in my view excellent music and very um, i I can see why they got caught up in it and wanted to change the world it was really so good and that continued in the 70s and into the 80s and they sort of got the idea then you could sort of revolutionize music every decade and uh, offer it up to kids and market it to them and then so they started sort of doing this. They started manufacturing the pop, the culture for the kids. It became less and less about the bands spontaneously coming up with new music. I think as the music industry, you know, corporate uh, guys just like inventing it for them and feeding it to them. And then and through the course of that, I think through over the years, they learned they can actually just feed them shit, like complete shit and they'll take it as long as it comes from the uh, trusted source. And yeah. I just really think in terms of pop music and, and pop, uh, off, like even the movies, the Marvel movies and things. I think they just lost all effort for trying to be original. Like think of the, in the in the seventies and the eighty, even through the eighties, be a lot of bands and filmmakers who would be anti-commercial. It would be at their core to be like, I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to produce a pop song in under fifteen minutes, you know, kind of thing. To be like that was an ethos they had. Like that doesn't exist anymore. Mm, yeah. And that was a good ethos to have. I think that was that's why I think that era. This is why again back to my tra- my posting where I post a lot of stuff from that era. That was the end of an era of a kind of anti-commercial, at least, at least an anti-commercial concept of art where it was at least unbounded by that kind of thing, where it was like a, where, you know, to, to the, to today's world is really like bound and shackled by the corporate values in so many ways. Right. right? And it's all about just, there's no, the concept, concept of rebellion is what nowadays? I don't even know. Like in the, in the, in the average person. It's like, I guess uh, to be a racist frog on Twitter, that's rebellion. <laughs> I guess, but Uh, it's also beyond the pale. They won't even, it's not like they don't look at it fondly like your old hippie, the old hippie that, you know. No, exactly. uh, Yeah, you're, you know, with that Berkeley protest or something. It's like, it's like, so things are too bifurcated and dissipated. And how that was like tacitly consented to by certain like levels of elites at the time. Like, for example, a lot of people that like are like a lot of weathermen, the ROTC centers in the 60s, they had, you know, they went on to grad school and they became, uh, poet laureates and phds and like you know the boomer in general like that's that's really crazy how like i don't know bill ayers pentagon and uh have like a a professorship and all of these you know and teach obama wow right like that's so i think like maybe do you feel like the art world also experienced that where maybe rebellion is always like faux rebellion and the elites sort of consent to certain things but i I don't know anymore because i feel like a lot of the elites like okay they do prop up the contemporary art world but Mm -hmm. 
there are elites like I'm thinking of that like I don't know it seems like even the aesthetic template of, of the elites are becoming debased like now they'd much rather pump money into like subversive media than like I don't know whatever I, I don't know I guess Kendall Wiley well, still gets commissions but you know what I mean yeah, yeah but you, and the odd thing for me is that you can still find actually good stuff here and there like I'm a big yeah. fan of this guy uh, Craig Zoller do you know that guy he, he's, a, he's a he's a filmmaker. He's a filmmaker. He made like Bone Tomahawk. Did you see that? And like oh um, yeah, yeah, Bone Tomahawk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what what was the other really good one? Uh, uh, Riot and Cell Block Ninety Nine. Do you see that? That was pretty good too. But, oh, that was but, a good one. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy. So he's a good and like sort of out of nowhere kind of old school, um, you know, gritty filmmaker. But he's also he's got like a heavy metal band that's also like a kind of classic era metal, which was really my kind of thing. Mm. And he does that. And he's also been making comics. Um, I don't know. I didn't really look into those so much, but I just was listening to a podcast with him uh, recently talking about all this different stuff he's into. And he really just treats it. Again, he treats his art in a craft kind of fashion where he's got his things he's a fan of. And he goes after it in recreating his own version of what they did. So he he was talking about his graphic novel and the art, the comic artist he was, and the storylines and what he thought his strengths were. And he just sort of just tackles it and goes at it. And, you know, him against the world. He's got he's obviously got a some kind of business sense or some in with he got these movies made. You know, these out of these movies that came out of left field that were not really system value movies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there was. Yeah. There's a lot of like quasi racism and those things and whatever, right? Or like, not 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 racism, but like unpc, you know, racist yeah. humor and stuff. Like stuff you would have seen in a Clint, Clint Eastwood movie, you know, thirty years ago or whatever. Um, so stuff like that still is out there here and there, and it's usually guys like that grifting through it on their own. And you know, I, I I'm a big fan to say of someone like him. I have to think of who else, but you know, the stuff appears here and there. Usually, again, it's kind of throwbacky stuff. You know, his style is reminiscent of older, mm. older things. Um, but it's there's so many things that are derivative now and going nowhere and feel like they're dead and like dead on their feet. But you hear like when I go around, I go out here, they always seem to play music in the shops everywhere. I don't know if they do that in Canada, but they do it here in Ireland. Oh, yeah. and they used to do that. And like it's a, you know, in the last 10 years or so more, I think everywhere you go, they hear this pop music. And it's really t it's not even it's not even the top 40 pop music from the radio. It's like an imitation of that they buy from some, some satellite radio of like wannabe the Lana Del Rey imitation or something. I don't know what it is. Like it's really as crap as it can be. And they're playing it as loud as they can everywhere you go. And it's like, why? Why do I hear this? Why must it be this way? And it's so, is this the end of music? It, will it just be this forever? Like we had like, you know, you had 10 it's years like the of, end of the music. guitar with Zoomers. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's like, it's caught on a loop. It's being trapped in a loop of itself and I can't, can't escape. Which I feel is the same story with the abstract painting and the. Mm. Yeah, I know you don't. Agree. We should talk about that because I know you don't agree. And I, wow. like, well, you, we, we, we more or less agree a lot of things. But if yeah. there's anything else, like Astro wanted to argue about that stuff, but I, we, I, I figured we would agree actually in quite a lot of things overall. But is there anything else from the book that you strongly disagree with? Let's say. I think uh, yeah. Let's. I wanted to ask you about the like art as like artists and craft and like contemporary quote unquote contemporary, like realism, like art renewal center and also science fiction. Well, let's back to that. What I really disagree with you on was Kandinsky. I feel because Kandinsky. Oh, okay. okay. So you go ahead first. Why do you hate nope. Vasily Kandinsky? And then I'll <laughs> the stage my defense. Well, he, he, he was the first, apparently there's others that were like trying to do it before him, but right, in right, right. popular culture, at least he was the first attempt at, an abstract painter yes. of just like here's my squiggles and my lines and my boxes you know there's no effort at being like representational in any way so as being the first to attempt that i had to single him single him out and talk about him yeah. uh, for it he was also unlike pollock i know you you have some sympathy for pollock's earlier work i really did not like any of his paintings at all uh kandinsky did have was a competent painter he did have some good paintings i thought Mm -hmm. um as well but in terms of what he was trying to do and like i don't hate him i, I just uh, i point him out as the first one to try and do this this trick this kind of like i just purely abstract sort of gimmick I, I, is the word i use a lot in the book 
you know. Yeah, I, mean, it, I, it I have disagreements with that, but go ahead, go. Ahead. <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, yeah. you know, it's it's like Duchamp and the rest of it, like shock value gimmick. It's like, oh, look at me presenting you with this, you know, random squiggle stuff. And apparently, you know, it's a good trick. It works. It's like people stare at it and think, oh, well, I, I kind of like that. And, you know, it's just so easy. And just like that, the whole uh, world of painting is subverted and over us, <laughs> dead, dead immediately. But it actually, he didn't really get that far. It wasn't really until Greenberg came along that yeah. the, language, the language was invented to excuse it with this uh, pseudo intellectualism. So Kandinsky didn't only got so far, but he was just I only I only brought him up as the in the book as the first person to try to present totally abstract work. Right, right. But I mean, I, I feel like having read on the spiritual and art, I feel like what Kandinsky was doing is he truly was looking at it from his like particular like theosophic lens where uh, he was creating a system by which like I wouldn't it was something beyond like mere art as aestheticism at that time. It was much more of like a system of like uh like, like he had a very like baroque sort of system of shapes and colors and temperatures and moods that would create a sort of language the way that music was a language that was expressing something what he felt was like deep within the human spirit and so i feel like when i was reading your book my one criticism was that i wouldn't think kandinsky would be a, a good candidate for the beginning of like this nihilistic commercialism that later the art world developed into um I feel like Kandinsky was doing something very much like similar to even the Egyptians with like a spiritual language represented in the pictorial. That wasn't necessarily abstraction, of course, but I feel like he was trying to do something that was akin to like music theory that had waves and moods and, and had sort of like, a, I know vibes are like a, a word that like Zoomers love nowadays, but very much he was trying to, he was trying to capture the vibes, Brandon. He was trying to capture the vibes. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Yeah, you could say capturing the vibes, sure. Yeah, yeah. But um, like a lot of what you said there, I would, yeah, I would kind of be like, yeah, that's kind of the. But your criticism would be like he was trying to systematize abstraction and and to make artwork. Well, I don't know. Something... I know in his case, he was just like I don't think he was trying to systematize. I don't think he had a grand plan or anything like that. Not like uh, that would I would put that more on um on um uh the critic uh what's his name the art critic that i uh, his name is suddenly flown out of my brain that we've mentioned several times already uh greenberg, greenberg? yeah greenberg sorry so but kandinsky was more just doing his thing i think just kind of like hey you know free free bird free wheeling but um all that language you use to explain the painting well it's because i, I read say, his I, book. I, I wish like, I, I wish we could have one of his paintings on the screen to look at and discuss and you can point out to me where you find this gothic you know, spiritualism in it when you're just looking, you know, in re in a purely realist, harsh, uh, you know, immediate terms, you're looking at literally like some wavy lines and like some little funny colored circles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, but they all mean uh, something though in his system. Well, supposedly, it, it, but you know, supposedly we're told they mean something through that language, through the narrative and the explanation of the painting, but it's not, it's not extant. And like in a, in a master painting, you don't need an explanation to explain why it's a genius painting. And so whenever you need a little description and explanation, I feel my, I feel it's suspect in terms, not in terms of, I knew not in his, in his case, I would give him some slack and that I feel like he was truly just experimenting, but it's not an experiment in my mind worth a whole lot of value. But, but I do feel that, they, they do represent something the way that he would try to represent music in visual form, the way that like, George O'Keefe would later try to do that. Like if, like there is something to his painting. Like you, you mentioned here explicitly composition. Um, damn, I can't read Roman numerals. Uh, VII. Um, he painted in 1913. Uh, like there, there is sort of like, like for example, if you look at Italian futurism, for instance, like there was clearly a sort of an attempt to capture rhythm and motion within a very solid medium and to sort of like break the bounds of like what representation can afford you. So I don't know, like I, Kandinsky certainly like influenced a lot of later futurists. That well, they did it about. with more, they did, they did it with more panache and technical skill than he did. They sort of, well, a yeah. lot of them did anyways. Um, I really don't like futurist um, posters. A lot of the posters, the really abstract jazzy posters. <laughs> I don't like those, but the paintings, there was a lot of good, really good paintings. Yeah. Trying to uh, show speed or whatever. But again, if you think of painting at, from my point of view, where it's ultimately just a craft thing and there's no sign 
in a single painting of provable sort of objective technical genius at work where because there's several paintings by Kandinsky like lots there's like I can think of one in my mind right now that's just like seriously like uh five circles of different colors I think but then maybe another little color of circle like it looks like it's just like it could literally be like a watercolor sketch pad of like a three-year-old or something right and so you can say well he's representing music <laughs> but uh oh. you know it's I know I, but this is my view anyway it's, you're it's killing that, me here <laughs> <laughs> there's, a chance, there's a chance there's always a chance it's a fraud and he's lying or you know you yeah, can't well. it's, so, it's not tangible it's there's a lot the language is what explains it and what gives it its higher meaning and that's makes me suspect yeah but i do feel like even in the art like even in the work of art like historically um the way that a lot of like ancient civilizations viewed the work of art wasn't exactly um an aesthetic it was like a spiritual practice i mean even okay, Greek but you have, okay, you have an age where they would pull out in egypt or the renaissance or any of it where some guy would come along and as far as we know and have like there was no galleries of like little uh, round circles or like you know concept art uh, conceptual art of like some guy standing there naked pulling a bowling ball or something you know or any of this mm. crazy stupid there was no as far as we know art um that's what it I mean. Wasn't. They didn't conceive of it as art. Like I think that's what Kandinsky was trying to get back to, and so in a weird way, like, like he they didn't conceive of it as like an aestheticism, like you know what I mean. Like it was very much integral to their whole civilization and their way of life. So. Well, yeah. Previously, I mean, art was always tied up with representing your civilization and yeah. proudly, and uh, tied up with religion and. You know, that's how it should be. <laughs> it should be just yeah, be sort of yeah. uh, extension, ex extenuation, extension of your belief and your pride in yourself as you exact your will upon the world. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Content Minded Podcast, where every Wednesday there are interesting guests, amazing ideas, solo streams, and discussions on a diverse array of topics from art, philosophy, history, and more. The free version will be available both here on YouTube and as a downloadable link on Anchor and Spotify, as well as on Substack. Each week, the full, uncensored, and spicier version will now be available on both Patreon and Substack, where you will have access to the full archive of both content-minded and of giant reviews where I break down interesting texts every week including other exciting paywalled articles and good content. Thank you all. Please like, share, and subscribe. God bless. Goodbye. Help keep the content renaissance alive. Too sweet.